Welcome to Rooted Intentionally. I'm Susan Carson, and it's my passion to create safe space for transformational encounters with Jesus through listening, healing prayer, and spiritual practices. And I've been bringing to you a series of conversations and spiritual practices on the subject of healing our image of God. These have been really rich, um, restorative conversations and practices. And today I'm super excited to bring to you my new friends, JR and Amy Roscoe. Welcome you guys. Hi Susan. Thank you, good to be here. Yeah, thanks for being with us. You guys are hailing from Canton, <laughs> Ohio. We're south of you in Cincinnati. So we have a Buckeye thing happening today. Mm -hmm. um, for folks who don't know you yet, you guys are co-pastors at First Church of the Resurrection in Canton, Ohio. You guys are ordained or in the process for you, Amy, of being ordained, right, in the Anglican okay. Church, and yet you're leading mm -hmm. a non-Anglican body, which is interesting for sure. Um, but you guys have a lot of background in pastoring, church leadership, um, now leading under the leadership of Bishop Todd Hunter, for those who might know his name, associated with the Telos Collective, for anybody who might be familiar with that. And if you're not yet, you probably might want to be. Um, what else would you guys want folks to know about you as we get started today? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's pretty good. Um, we have, have been pastoring here for the past couple years. Uh, we also are parents of three kids. They would they would want us to say that. They would. <laughs> they, would. they are um, almost 10, seven, and four, two girls, and then a, a boy. That's a big part of our life and ministry right now as well. Of course. Yes. And I did note one of your daughters is named Junia, which is like the best girl name ever. I'll mm -hmm. just say that. So love it. Yeah. Well, let's just jump in then, because uh, I am excited for this conversation. We always start with the same question, because uh, everything that I do um, comes back to the same word, rooted, living more rooted and grounded in the love of God. And so I'm wondering, in this season we've been in, what's been helping you both live more rooted? So I'm going to, I, you know, I'm going to follow up on the theme I just mentioned, which is parenting three young children mm -hmm. is definitely a practice um, that, that's, it's an inevitable part of our lives right now, but it is something that really keeps me rooted. It keeps me connected to the here and now, uh, to, to really being present. Uh, our, our kids give, give us harder existential questions than any congregant ever has. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got a lot of questions about the afterlife and the nature of God, and they keep us on our toes. Um, as well as um, uh, Dave Fitch in, in his book about faithful presence talks about being with children is actually a space where we, we can encounter and be with God. And I found that to be true when I am present to it. And when I'm not um, trying to multitask too much, um, I've really found that um, you know, being with my children has been a, a way that God's really um, been able to get my attention mm. and learn more things about um, his character and be present to that. Mm, I love that. Yeah, kids live in the present, right? So they bring us into the present with them if, yeah. if we allow that. Yeah, right. that's beautiful. <laughs> I feel like I'm always trying to bring them somewhere else, but they bring yes. me back to the present and that can be a beautiful thing when I am submitted to it and willing to receive mm. what God has for me there. Mm, so good, Amy. Thanks. JR. Yeah. yeah. As I'm thinking about that question, the a phrase occurred to me. Um, I feel like it's what I hope is a holy kind of selfishness mm. <laughs> that is actually helping me to re live rooted. Um, I say that because I, nothing about my life uh, up until the most recent years has like led me to desire. A lot of my life has been unrooted, uprooted or something like yeah. that. I was just reflecting the other day and the fact um, we moved here to Canton in the summer of 2016. 
so just five years and uh, I have, I'm 42. I've never in my life uh, lived under one roof longer than I've lived in our current home. Wow. Um, wow. So from being really transient as a family um, early on to college, to grad school, to a pastoral opportunity, to uh, helping to start and then lead a ministry called Missio Alliance that had me on a plane at least once a month mm. um, doing events, wow. meeting with partners and those kinds of things. Rootedness and groundedness, uh, locality has not been this huge feature of my life. Mm. And I would say about six to seven years ago, um, God began stirring something inside of me. And this came mm. about through a variety of means that I'm really grateful for uh, to that there was a process that was begun in me of cultivating an actual desire uh, for more rootedness and groundedness and a focus on the local um, and those kinds of things. And so there's still something in me that like walks at some of that, like a, I don't know, a ministerial FOMO uh, or something mm, like that. Yeah. Um, Canton, Ohio is uh, not exactly the epicenter of progressive culture uh, with people streaming here for uh, any kind of reason. And so as two people who have had the opportunity to like live in some world-class cities, find ourselves at home in urban mm -hmm. environments and uh, where there's like bigger, bigger urban environments with a lot going on. Um, I would like for me, like our kids definitely do this in a practical way, but I've been a lot more keyed into in the last recent years, something that the Holy Spirit's been churning inside of me uh, that's created an unnatural, when I say unnatural, I mean, it doesn't feel innate to me, an, un, an unnatural kind of longing um, to be more rooted uh, with the idea that like, there's something that God has for me, like the, mm. a, a kind of freedom and a kind of blessing that I think God wants me to know that I would never know unless I gave myself over to mm. forms of rootedness. And groundedness. Mm. Wow. That seems like that could be a whole conversation in and of itself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's uh, that sounds like really deep, meaningful work that's happening. Um, well, as much as I'd love to follow that trail, I'm going to steer us back a little bit to our topic, which um, so I'm just curious for both of you and um, maybe maybe there is a connection here, but when we, as you think about your image of God, how was that shame uh, shaped for you for better and for worse, maybe? How was that shaped in your lives? Yeah, so for me, I would say I, um, I grew up in a Christian home and, you know, was going to church all, all through that time. I think I had really formative experiences with um, like Christian camps, you know, that, that my church did. And, and, um, an especially formative time for me was attending a Christian university. Um, I went to Indiana Wesleyan university and studying there and being in Christian community was, was really influential for, for my faith journey, um, being in that kind of, you know, early twenties stage of life and, um, you know, branching out for the first time. And I think, um, and then for, in there, in that time, also having some of my first cross-cultural experiences um, internationally as well as locally. Um, and those, I mean, those are the things I think of when I think of things that were really formative and expanding and growing my view of who God is and how, who I am and how we relate to each other. Um, so I'm really, really thankful for, for those experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I, it was not long ago I was reflecting on this. I, I asked a group of other people like what they regarded as their very first earliest memories of a picture mm -hmm. of God that began to form in their minds. And for me, um, the earliest memories I have were of my mom um, putting my brother and I down to bed when we were very small and leading us uh, in this like nursery rhyme-ish kind of prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul 
to take. And maybe some people kind of stop the prayer there, at least in our case, my case, my mom would then lead us into like a litany of, and God bless. And then we would, my brother and I would go through lists of people that we hope that God would bless. And with whatever mind I had is like, I don't know, four-year-old, uh, three-year-old, four-year-old doing this sort of thing. I think what began to be formed in me um, was both a, a picture of God's in charge. God's the one who receives something I apparently have called a soul um, that if I were to die, which is an interesting thing to like, try to like have a three or four year old think about right before yeah. they're going to bed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, but that he would receive it. Right. So he was somehow in charge. Um, but that also he was interested in the blessing of other people. Um, and so very early on, I had this image of God formed in me um, that God desires to bless people. And that it's uh, a worthwhile practice for me to think about those whom I would wish for God to bless mm. in my life. So, th yeah, those are yeah some of the earliest memories I have of some image of God beginning to be formed in me. Mm. I love that. It sounds like for, for both of you, your initial experiences were largely positive, that a image of a caring connected God was formed for you at an early age, um, which is a beautiful gift that mm -hmm. you were both given. And I'm sure you know, in the roles that you play in many people's lives, that is not always what happens. <laughs> it sure. wouldn't have been my story, but I love that it's your story. So I wonder, as you look back on how your faith journey has evolved, how that image of God has sort of influenced your faith journey. Mm. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. You know, it, it's not lost on me. What a blessing that was to not have to maybe unlearn some things right about, yeah. about who God was um, and count that a huge blessing. I think for me, um, the journey has been um, watching my understanding of God grow. Right. So, mm -hmm. so having, you know, starting with a kind of narrow view of who God is and, and having experiences that just open me up to the, to how much bigger God is than the box. Maybe, um, I have him in or understand him to be. And so, um, for me, you know, I mentioned at the end of that, just having cross-cultural experiences have been really formative for me in terms of seeing God outside of, um, the, the cultural expression that, that I come from, right. Seeing, mm -hmm. um, people, uh, interpret the, the scriptures, right. Which are historical texts with, through different cultural eyes and seeing what, what may um, be more clear in other cultures about who God is different ways, um, you know, different facets of his character, I guess. And so, you know, uh, the, and the idea of Christian community, right? Being in spaces with other Christians and other believers and getting to dialogue and hear from them what, what their understanding is of God, how they interpret scripture, um, that kind of conversation and community has been really formative for me. As I think about different, the spaces where I've really grown in my understanding of who God is, it's, it's, it's most often been in places of like vulnerable and authentic community, whether that's for a short season or a long season. Um, that's been really transformative for me is, is, you know, the, the gathered people of God coming together and learning more, you know, letting God revealing himself more in those kind of contexts is not only do I speak, but I listen and I hear and I learn from other people's lived experience. Mm, I love that. I'm going to put you on the spot. So if you can't think of an example offhand, that's totally okay. But I'd be curious if you have a more specific example of maybe a way that you experienced God through international relationships or community, something that you saw there, experienced there that specifically maybe expanded your view of God in an unexpected way? Yeah, I think, um, you know, a big thing has been uh, in, you know, from a North American Western worldview where we tend to be highly individualistic. And I found um, times I've read scripture with people who maybe come from a more community oriented um, cultural background. Um, they don't read that into the scriptures. They don't read individualism into the scriptures, which, you know, come from 
more of an Eastern bent anyway, right? So they're, they're right. probably close, their interpretation is probably closer to accurate than mine would be from, from my perspective. And so, um, you know, studying scripture with other believers who don't necessarily bring, um, yeah, the kind of maybe individualism um, that I have to, to different texts has been enlightening for me to see, okay, yeah, maybe that's another way to, to interpret this that that's different than you know, maybe where, where I initially thought this passage meant. Yeah. Kind of oh, that's so good. That's so good. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. JR, I see the wheels turning. The wheels are turning. So I'm trying to think. So, you know, I, I, I mentioned that those were some of the early ways in which an image of God was formed in my mind. Um, I should also say in the next breath, I wasn't really raised in the church, like Easter and Christmas kinds of things, right? So mm-hmm. like I inherited um, like my, my parents had both been thoroughly churched. And so I inherited, uh, some of that DNA like came through them, but like for a variety of reasons, uh, I didn't grow up in the church and I came to faith through the ministry of FCA in high school. And whether it was, I don't know what the constellation of things were that conspired to make this the case, but I became like a raging zealot um, when I made a personal decision to give my life to Christ mm. through FCA, I don't actually fault FCA or the guy that led me to the Lord or anything like that. I just think sure. that there was, but like, I'm just naming something happened where going from not a very robust understanding of who God was, there was something that happened in me that led me to believe what God wanted of me was perfection. And the thing that I then, the way I could best honor God um, was to make sure that everybody else around me knew (laughs) that like what God really wanted was perfection. Um, Some of your audience, I'm sure, are going to be Enneagram aficionados and will now be deducing your guest JR is indeed an Enneagram one. And so I think like part of that was happening, you know, that formation was happening uh, in me as well at that yeah. time. Um, and then I would say, like, I kind of carried that into college. There was a, a softening. Like, I went to Malone University, which is a small Christian liberal arts university here in Canton, had a wonderful experience of Christian community there, got into Bible and theology classes, which began to open my horizons. And I was very blessed to like come under a faculty that was, um, tuned to try to helping students um, have an open mind about Mm -hmm. things and to think for themselves and to expose us to a variety of ways of thinking and engaging and all that kind of stuff. And then I launched out into the church world and that was the first time, okay, now I have to sort of reconcile my understanding of who God is with this vocational calling that I've received in pastoral ministry. And of course, that's like a whole other angle. And then I just want to say like something very new began to happen for me when I went to Fuller Seminary as a grad student in 04. It's a couple of years ago, 2004. And similar, like Amy, you know, sharing about her having cross-cultural and international experiences, Fuller was a place where like that was kind of brought to my doorstep, um, right, as a, as a residential student out in LA yeah. at the Pasadena campus. And all of a sudden rubbing shoulders for the first time ever with my first time immersed in urban environment and having international students and world-class faculty. Um, And whether by the grace of God or uh, what I had been, had been given to me in college and after um, I felt like I, there was an opportunity in grad school for me to like wrestle down, like what's my faith really in? Is it in this God who at the end of the day is in, is unknowable, which isn't, Mm. or is mysterious, I should say, like we know God in Christ. So I don't mean he's unknowable in that way, but there's a mystery to him or in this fixed set of beliefs Mm. that I'm walking in with about who God is and about what faith entails and about what it means to be the church. And again, so to go back, like whether by the grace of God or the things that have been passed on to me, Mm -hmm. um, I felt like there was a deep formational work that ha- happened where I was able to say like faith in God who in whom there is a mysterious way of no- knowing 
is different than like my lived experience. Um, anyways, yeah. some of those things happen in like we're yeah. evolutionary um, factors for me in my formation of thinking about who God is and how he relates to us. Yeah, that's, I just hear in both of your stories, the, the opening to a bigger sense of God is knowable and yet mystery at uh, the confines of our culture and our experience are just too small, right. To hold yeah. him. Right. He's, he's bigger than that. Um, so I wonder how has this journey that you're still on, right. Affected your sense of mission, vision, ministry, the, the thing that you're about doing now mm. in Canton. Well, I think, um, you know, one thing, you know, you talked about uh, this idea of the good and beautiful God, as we have been in ministry in various capacities um, over the years, uh, you, you come to see as um, you come to see how people's image of God manifests itself, right? It's often an unarticulated understanding, but uh, it's, it's something where there's a presenting problem or um difficulty with God. And then you dig deeper and find out, okay, well, that's because you think God is this, right. And which is why you're acting this way or thinking this way. Uh, and so I think for us, just think realizing at the root of so much, um, you know, so much difficulty, I guess, with people either having a healthy relationship with God or, you know, acting in accordance with the way that they want to in their lives, a lot of it comes back to, as you know, as you're talking about with people, right, just um, malformed views of who God is. And so I think that's why that's important for us in our ministry is to really dig, dig down and um, converse about some of those things, because so much um, of our understanding of God, I think, either is formed early or is formed in our subconscious. And so often people can't even articulate um, the assumptions that they carry, right, which is true in for all of us, right. In so many areas, it's, it's really, it's hidden in a blind spot. And so, yeah. um, helping to illuminate those, those dark corners, helping to give people words to articulate what, what do they really think of God and giving them permission even to articulate those things without, um, feeling like there's a right answer they have to say, or I, I can't say this, even if I think it, but like, what do you really think, mm -hmm. um, about who God is? And there's a free, safe space to say that, um, because it's true whether you're willing to say it or not, right? Like if, if that's yeah. affecting your life. Um, and so, but that really involves, as you know, right? Creating really safe spaces often for people to be able to freely articulate what they're, what they're really thinking, as opposed to giving the Sunday school answer that they know is right. Or, you know, even like what Jared was just talking about, like, I know what I'm supposed to say. So that's what I'm going to say. And I'm going to push down or deny any other feelings um, or, or beliefs that, that I'm holding. Um, mm -hmm. and so really, you know, helping people realize belief isn't just an intellectual thing, but it's where our heart and minds are connected. And so what, what we believe about yeah. God, isn't just what we can articulate based on what we've memorized from scripture or what, what someone told us to say when we are in a catechism of some sort, but, um, you know, it, it starts with being authentic to, you know, what your, your heart and gut and head all say together mm -hmm. and articulating that in a safe space. And then bring it to the light of Christ to shine truth into those spaces and, um, you know, journey into a place of um, healing and wholeness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'd, I'd love to hear more about how you guys are helping people in that journey. Like, how do you help people? Cause people are watching and listening, right? How do we begin to sort of unpack that for ourselves and what have you seen that's helpful for people in terms of really moving into a more authentic space and sort of examining well, what am I really believing and what is the fruit of that in my life and in my faith? Yeah. Um, I'll name two things really quick. And then if Amy has anything to add, I hope she does. But um, the first two things that come to mind are like one, uh, asking, asking good questions, asking mm -hmm. profound questions that people don't often have a chance to think about. Like one of my favorite ones that I'm trying to find opportunities to ask people is something along the lines of like, how do you feel about who you're becoming? 
Like that's just a very mm. different question than like, mm. do you believe such and such? Mm. Um, and I think it just wow. opens up different pathways to conversation and like unearthing things that are in there. Uh, and especially with, I'll say, especially with pastors, I don't know that a lot of folks, at least in our context, are super used to having pastors ask them that kind of question. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's just one example, right? Like asking questions like that, that help to unearth like what's happening beneath the surface of people's lives. And even like, you know, in a little bit, Amy's gonna lead us through this practice that has to do with like tending to our soul. Mm -hmm. So another question I've asked folks is like, you know, how, how do you feel like your soul is? And most people just like, don't really think about themselves as having a soul or how to tend to it or think that what it means to be a Christian has everything in the world to do with like tending to the state of our souls. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing, like creating spaces and environments to ask those kinds of questions, whether they be one-to-one -one or in groups. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would say is simply like holding, holding space for people who like being really, really, really okay with the fact that everybody's on a journey mm -hmm. and saying, I don't need you to pretend to believe or to behave in certain ways mm -hmm. in order to make me feel okay as your friend or as your pastor. Mm. Like, wow. because, because now, and I don't know if this is a season of life or something like, you know, 42 midlife sort of thing where I'm like, I know that I've been on a journey. Um, but my, our, I'll say our aim pastorally isn't like, how do we just get people to believe and say they believe they believe the right things and behave in the most befitting ways, which isn't to say there's not a place of importance for believing and behaving. I know, you know, like, sure. you know, that, but it is to say like, um, all of it's for not, it means absolutely nothing. <laughs> if you're not actually tending to like, who are you and who are you becoming? So being able to hold space for people like that. So, I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, I had a very good friend invite me to come and sit around a campfire with, um, I don't know, six, seven, eight other guys who all had like really horrible stories to tell about how they had been mistreated by the church mm. and like really like, or big questions about God that they didn't feel like church is not a place where I can go to ask these questions. And so my role in that space wasn't like to fix anything, to do anything, to say anything, was just to sit there and say, these are valid questions. And someone, someone who wears a collar metaphorically or literally should acknowledge the pain that's been caused to you uh, over the course of your life. And I'm really sorry. Um, so sorry, I got a little long winded, but those are like two no. ways that I think that like we uh, as Christian leaders and as pastors are actually trying to like do that kind of work here. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And it's so healing um, and so needed. So Amy, I see you're going to. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, we're, we're big fans of the Good and Beautiful series uh, by James Smith. Uh, and so we've been really trying to integrate some of that into the life of our church through sermons and book studies and whatnot. And I love the, the progression of the three books um, because it ends with the good and beautiful community, right? Which is uh, the church we long to see in the world. Uh, you go one step, one step back and it's um, the good and beautiful life, which is, you know, living the life we want to live in Christ. But one step before that is the good and beautiful God. And, you know, we just really agree with that premise that if you don't have a, 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 a foundation of understanding that God is good and beautiful, you're not going to be living that life uh, that you want to live or, you know, our ch churches won't be all that they could be either. And so that, that really great progression mm -hmm. that he has in that uh, yeah. series of books has been something we're trying, we've been using in the life of our church to really stir conversations and yeah. expose some of those things that, you know, maybe people haven't thought about or articulated before. Mm, I love the intentionality of that. Um, and I love those books as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the question that sort of for me was the thing that spurred this whole series that we're doing on was, I mean, A.W. Tozer asked this question in a different way, really, but what if how we see God is how we see everything? Mm -hmm. And 
ourselves and others, right? And so our ability to see and know God as loving, right, is at the core of our ability to love ourselves and love yeah. others. And I hear that and what you guys are sharing that this is about identity, right? It's not just about some abstract beliefs that generate some behaviors in our lives, right? It's a knowing that forms us at the level of our identity, yes. right? And that right. changes everything. Um, and I hear that healing thread and what you're sharing too, that Right. We don't emerge unscathed from this life and we don't emerge unscathed from church usually <laughs> and damage uh, happens and those things form, right? Shape and misshape how we see God and how we see ourselves. And yeah. Um, so I want to get to this practice, but I'm just curious because I'm very much about creating safe space for people, right? Because that's where these conversations and authenticity and these this deep work can happen. Are there some things that you guys have seen that are just really important in creating the kind of safe space where these conversations can happen and these questions can be asked? Mm. Uh, you know, I would say, you know, wa wanting to be a safe person doesn't necessarily mean you have safe space right away, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And I think for yeah. me learning um, that that can be a slow process of mm -hmm. gaining trust or um, figuring out what, what equals a safe space for different people, different groups of people and whatnot. And um, it can be easy as, you know, a pastor just to want to jump right to that space and be like, okay, this is a safe space. I told you it was a safe space. So, <laughs> right. Yes. So, what else do so I need? come on, everybody share right. your stuff. So be safe. Yes. Uh, yeah. But that it doesn't work that way. Right. And so just yeah. being patient with um, not rushing, you know, uh, people and being okay with the, the pace things are going has been something I think God has had to challenge me with um, on that journey of, it, for people's own good generally you know like I want I want to move to a place where like they're willing to be open and um find deeper levels of healing but uh you can't rush that for anyone and something that you know Bishop Todd says a lot is that you know we're to leave people you know before God themselves he say, how does he say it you always have to leave people uh in charge of their own lives before God yeah. that's it so that that idea I think um, gives us freedom in ministry that we can create spaces and set tables, but we don't have to manipulate. We don't, we don't, we, we shouldn't, and we don't have to, there's no, um, results that we're in charge of, but we are just to, to set a table and prepare space, um, for people. And, and, and they, it's up to them how they want to respond to God in those spaces. Mm. Um, and, and we can keep experimenting and trying to do that, better and in ways that get us out of the way more um, mm. and that are maybe more contextually appropriate for for different people or different groups but that we're not as 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 ministers sometimes even there's a I think I, other people we know other clergy or people that they feel pressure on themselves to you know I failed if if something didn't transpire in the space I created and just having some freedom from that kind of pressure oh. um, has been I think a, a healthy journey for me. Yeah, um, absolutely. I'll mention just one other thing. I can be really yeah. quick about it, but I think um, what I would call like a mature vulnerability mm. um, in being able to say to people, like I, I can, I, I'm more than willing to demonstrate vulnerability around whatever the conversation is or the question that we're asking. Um, and yet to do so in a way I'm thinking especially of people who have become, who are moving through phases of deconstruction or have become really cynical and jaded. And there is a real balancing act to be done to say like, I can be authentically vulnerable um, and yet transcend the deconstruction or the cynicism or the jadedness that you might currently be experiencing. Um, and that is a, just a fine line to walk. Uh, mm. And I, as in most things, I really think Jesus is our model for this, that the way in which Jesus demonstrated vulnerability 
Mm. Like no one ever did it better than him or more Mm. sacrificially than him, right? Mm. And yet he also did it in such a way that like, there was nothing in him that was inclined to join in um, for the sake of trying to be one of or gain a hearing to like join in and try to mask mask who he really was um, Mm -hmm. in order to feel like he was one of like, yeah. So let me just leave it at that and say like, I don't think unless we're willing to demonstrate true vulnerability, I don't know that anybody, it doesn't matter how creative you can be about a physical space or great questions or something like that. It's only ever going to feel like some sort of bait and switch Mm. or that there's something duplicitous happening. If we don't first enter in and say, I also have a story to share here, or I have my own questions about these things. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's yes. Yes. To all of that. So good. So good, you guys. Um, Well, Amy, you have a practice for us. Um, And I would love to uh, just invite people into this space that you're going to open up for us together. Um, So I would love to turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so like I said, we're actually doing the Good and Beautiful series right now with our church through um, preaching and also um, a book study and conversation and things like that. And so this week we were, we're still in the book, The Good and Beautiful God, and the chapter was God Transforms. And um, so at the conclusion of uh, the message I gave this week, um, I invited people into um, an imaginative prayer practice. And if people haven't done that before, um, this is just a, a space of um, using a sacred imagination to um, visualize um, a context. I'm going to ask people to visualize um, their garden uh, as a, their, their soul as a garden uh, in this time. And um, it's just a time to really, um, yeah, be aware of what God might be um, speaking through images, through imagination. And if it's, you know, not doing anything for you, that's fine. But like, just be open to where the spirit might want to lead in the space is, uh, yeah, the, it's something that's been, I think for us, we've been doing some imaginative prayer with our kids um, as a regular practice and have found mm-hmm. for them. And for us, it's been um, a really different and good way to connect with God on a different level. And so hopefully this, if this is new to folks, they can, um, yeah, see, see where God takes it in their lives or uh, yeah, go from there. So awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to um, open us in prayer and then I'm just going to um, ask, ask you to close your eyes and I'll just um, give some prompts of things to look for or think about and leave some silent spaces. And then I'll kind of close our time together in prayer if that is okay. That sounds that perfect. Good? All right. Well, let's pray. All right, God, we, we come to you and we commit this time and space to you, Father. I pray that you would remove distractions, clear our minds of the other things that we would be tempted to think about or focus on in this time. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would give us sacred imaginations, that you would give us holy imaginations. May we hear from you, Holy Spirit, guide our thoughts in this time. So if you haven't already, uh, I would ask that you would close your eyes, maybe take some deep breaths, get comfortable in your chair, and imagine the garden of your soul. Imagine your soul as a garden. What does that look like? Look around. Where are good things flourishing? What do they look like? Where do you see beauty? Where do you see growth? Where do you see life? As you look around at the growth, at the beauty, ask God, what 
what does this growth, what does this beauty represent? What is beautiful in the garden of your soul? Thank God for that. Keep looking. What else do you see? Do you see any weeds or unwanted growth in your garden? Is there an untended corner of your garden? Or maybe are there weeds growing in and amongst some of the flowers or fruit or good things there? Ask God what these might represent. Is there an area of the garden that needs some deeper work in order to bring about deeper flourishing? Ask God what work that might need to be. Now, as you've been in this garden, notice what season is it? Is that significant in some way? Look around some more. Do you see anyone else in your garden? Is Jesus there? If you don't see Jesus, ask him, where are you? Show yourself to me. Does he want to say anything to you? Listen. Is there anything else that you are hearing or noticing in this space? Take a moment to thank God for what he's shown you during this time as you have contemplated the garden of your soul. Father, we thank you that you are a good and beautiful God and that you do good things in our lives. Thank you for this time uh, together that we've been able to pause and listen to what your Holy Spirit might say. I pray that you would seal in the heart of each one participating um, anything that you want them to keep and dwell on and uh, consider. And Lord, if there's anything that was not of you, that that would just um, blow away as chaff, that would just uh, go away. But the, uh, the things of you would stay. All this we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank that... you so much for having us. Oh, thank you guys. Um, if folks want to follow up with you if they have questions or want to connect with you to ask more about what you're doing there in Canton, what's the best way for them to get in touch? Uh, maybe through cantonabbey.org. Um, uh, Canton Abbey is um, a nonprofit uh, social enterprise. Um, no, that's not the word. Community development um, organization we started at the end of 2019 uh, with some friends. So cantonabbey.org is a place that you would find us. We're both on Facebook, um, Amy and JR, Roscoe, R-O-Z-K-O. And we're here at First Church Canton. Yeah, so feel free to reach out by email or on Facebook or whatnot. Yeah. Happy to interact and dialogue. Awesome. 
thank you guys. Thanks, Susan. So much. Um, if this time has been meaningful for you as it has been for me, you know how to connect with JR and Amy now. You can connect with me, uh, find my book, podcasts, socials, all that stuff at susancarson.net. It would be a joy to journey with you. Thanks for joining us today. We bless you to live deeply rooted in love.